Hello, spacers. Welcome to Starlight, a space opera. I'm Isaac, your host and GM for the adventures ahead. This show, whether you're watching or listening, is a labor of love, and one that we want to make the best for you. So if you can, take a moment to freely subscribe or share however is most comfortable for you. Thanks. Now let's plot a course to Starlight. Hey guys, and I'm super pumped to bring this up. This is our first ever competition, and we are glad to be able to announce a winner. So, as we had talked about last time, we ran a competition where all you had to do was follow the podcast or leave a review, um, and you would get a chance to possibly win one of our sponsors, Loki Battle Mats Prizes. It is a flip mat with a bunch of different terrain, and we are proud and excited to announce the winner. So, without further ado, here it is. The winner this time is Just a Basic Bard. Just a Basic Bard says, Amazing. Excellent podcast that has quickly become my favorite. The plot twists and sound effects make me feel like I'm being teleported into a world of the players. Looking forward to the new releases. Thank you, Basic Bard. And just so you know how you can claim your prize and get in contact with us is you will see down in the links of the podcast our email at thestarlightadventures at gmail.com. Go ahead and email us there in order to claim your prize, and we will have it sent to you, uh, and you won't have to pay shipping or anything like that. So email us um, and claim your prize, and hopefully you get to roll the dice in your own awesome world. And for those of you who didn't win, there were plenty of you. Karth Cross to name one, Cameron DeFord to name another. Thank you for your support of the show. Keep your ears peeled. There's going to be more giveaways in the future. All right, guys. Enough of this. Let's get to the goods for this week's episode of Starlight. Step forward as you enter into these doors and pass from the land of mortals. Shed your ego, lay bare your pain, and bend your knee to the survival of the Federation. Mr. Turnby, Mr. Craw, welcome to the halls of servitude, the sacred and the divine. Today, as elected speakers, you join the small few who will walk the halls of the triumvirate see the halls of the past triumphs and failures wars and peace your first lesson as we prepare you for the possibility of ascension is this the people of the federation are fickle quick to forget peace quick to blame and as all mortals they thrive off conflict it is the thing that reminds them they are alive the people will seek it Unchecked, they will chase conflict to their own destruction and their society's destruction. It is the will of the Triumvirate to create controlled conflict, to project to the future and prepare for what may and what may not be. Now see here, as we enter the wing of our current leader, the Sovereign, as elected speakers, See the truth for yourself. Fascinating. I I don't understand this. This is... Affirmative. The truth is simple and terrifying. Now that you see the truth of the Sovereign, you know the truth of the others. Let us reminisce on your predecessor's role, as one of you will ascend to the head of the Triumvirate. The Sovereign is the hammer that crushes and the scepter that decides. It is a constitutional monarchy at the best, and a dictator and manners of conflict at worst. War is the inheritance of all corners of the Triumvirate, but for the Sovereign, it is its providence. 
Under the Sovereign, there is no Imperium to hold check. There is only the requirement of the Constitution. The Sovereign Speaker, as you can see, will soon be added to the greater ecosystem that makes up the eternal and wise minds that rule our Federation. Where other members make unstable messes for social causes and outcasts, the Sovereign takes the mandates of the last galactic cycles and cleans it up with steel and laser. It is a time for expansion and prosperity. That is, of course, until the people lose their appetite. Hence, before they become too bitter, while they walk the thin line of weariness, we pull back to a new cycle so that they might forget and enjoy what is new and refreshing. The time of quickly decided policy, big stick politics, and heavy-handed use of the yeth is nearing its end. The time to refresh is near. So both of you, take one more look at your future. Are you ready? I... I accept this future. This... This is not what I signed up for. <coughs> I give it up. I... I don't want to be speaker. Oh dear. I apologize, but your retirement is not possible. It is mandated so. We walk a thin line with the Federation, and we as Progners must do everything we can to safeguard what the original Triumvirate set up. And we must do what is best for the long-term stability of the people. Negative. There will be no leaving these halls. You were elected by the people, and it would not do for the- <coughs> I, I have to escape. Please do not make this more difficult than it has to be. Oh. Oh. Like the deep ones, I will... Halt. Prepare the rehabilitation and education room. Affirmative. I'm sorry for you to see that, Mr. Turnby, but this is the way of it. It was no mere motto when we talked of servitude to the people. She will not be harmed, and neither will you. She will be made to see her duty and understand the gravity of all of our destinies. Now come, there is much to learn. You will speak for the hand if elected, so let us meet the minds that are. There will be much to repair you for in the wake of the Sovereign's aggressive policies. The people are weary of war, and they are ready for the tide that raises all. Alright guys, hey, welcome to this, uh, it's May, this lore segment, um, in May, and, uh, we're coming up, it'll be a whole year anniversary of the show here soon in a few months, and that's pretty dang exciting. We hope you enjoyed the first look into one of the corners of the Triumvirate for this month, as well as enjoyed all of the episodes, um, and I hope you can just hear the, the hard work that the cast is putting into taking on the roles of the characters, the editing going into the show, and just really enjoying it. I know that we are all just having a blast telling this story and doing it for those of you that are listening. Um, and speaking of listeners, we actually wanted to give a shout out. Go ahead and take it away, Courtney. First of all, I just want to say thanks to everyone um, giving reviews to the show. This has been a really cool experience to have everyone starting to give back verbally to us to that degree. Um, we had Karth Krat, Karars. Um, Were you going to say Karth Krat? That's or what it Karth? said. 
C R A R S S. Karth Kras. Karth Kras. <laughs> <laughs> Who gave us a five star review, which we're super thankful for. He said, absolutely blown away by this. I continue to be in awe of your storytelling ability, your gifted cinematic integration into your work to create an encapsulating environment for your audience, and I will never get tired of hearing you voice your characters. This is fantastic, and I can't wait for more. This is basically a review on Isaac. So well done, Isaac. Well, I... <laughs> thanks, thanks. I think that goes to everyone, though. And, um, yeah, so keep giving the reviews. It's a great way that helps our show get um, discovered, uh, and... It is our pleasure to, to highlight it and talk about it. So without further ado, um, well, actually, with further ado, I, I was actually thinking this could be kind of a fun way to open it up and just kind of like share a little bit more about us. And so um, this is kind of an open-ended question, but what, what, are you, what are you watching these days? Like, what's kind of, would you say, what's your number one like show or podcast you guys have been listening to um i've been really into just military history in general recently um so with that i got into the show band of brothers um which is a really really good show and then in but way before that i've been listening to jocko willick's podcast um which is fantastic um and he really walks through like leadership and military history and just kind of walking through what life in the military looks like and it's really fascinating um and i learned some great lessons from that mm -hmm. what nice, about you nice. um oh uh, for me i'm probably c pretty similar to nathan in the things that i've been l looking at recently um obviously i take i i'm ultra competitive and so I take what I'm doing super seriously, so uh, I, I really like listening to Critical Role, and I, I can really just enjoy them, but then I've been listening to a ton of Dungeons & Dragons podcasts for anywhere from like five minutes to the whole episode, as well as audio dramas to learn what what we, what we I can do better in the editing process and as a, as a GM, um, and so with that, I've been really into this audio drama called Dust. And each episode's about 15, 20 minutes on on uh, just podcast or on, I think it, they might have audio version on YouTube. And it, it is about the aftermath of Earth being destroyed and a singular being called Terran, who was once a human, like had his entire consciousness like uploaded into this like living spaceship with like the ability to, to create an army. And it's going out to try and commit genocide against the race of species that completely destroyed Earth. And it's a, it sounds really simple, and it kind of is, but it's so beautifully done. And mm. I'm just en engrossed in that. And then, like, so, so yeah. You said it's called Dust? Is yeah. that what you would look yeah. up? Dust Season 4. It's, it's okay. amazing. I'm going to write that down. Um... I guess so. Nobody's here really for these other things. They're here for the best podcast, uh, YouTube show, Starlight. Um, so why why don't we jump into this? Um, Sam couldn't be here. Sam voices Clive, obviously, uh, but he did have a topic we wanted to talk about that he wanted to talk about, and it is all about cuisine. So to kick it off, a little bit of like jumping into your guys' characters. What would be McKenna and his favorite meal? Ooh. I feel like McKenna's into like different cultures food. So she would be somewhere between like traditional like Japanese ramen and then like traditional um what is it what was the the um oh gosh, we love it. Indian food, the curry? Curry. Yeah, yeah like really like spicy, traditional curry. I can see that being almost like a loxodon type of meal, like curries and stuff like that. Right, like ramen would be the comfort meal. Traditional as far as like when you're going over for your first date to a loxodon's family and you're getting traditional loxodonian food, it's going to be curry. Nice. Yeah. Nice. So um, <laughs> we, have, we have sushi, space serpent, and curry and ramen. Ramen. Which I feel like those are all little gateways into everyone's 
soul that um with yeah. George what would be the DMs oh the DM doesn't need anything but the do of the universe but oh. every nat one you guys roll is food what I, for your yeah, soul it, it it feeds me um and then so I uh, I want to do justice to what Sam wanted to talk about because he was also very interested in, uh, in it from a, a world building perspective um and so I feel like the only time I got to to, to use food as a world building perspective was with Atlas and the and the the space serpent and now to kind of like go further on what Sam wanted is he wanted me to talk about Ninoyan cuisine and so I'm going to tell you guys right now I am guessing there <laughs> I'm sorry I don't have a book of recipes for every planet and culture in this game. Okay, so. let's think of it this way, though, before you get into the question. The environment in Ninoy, mm -hmm. is there water in the area? Oh, for sure. Okay, so you have fish. Uh, yeah, so that's actually where I was going to go, though. Was like, if I was going to spitball and guess what they ate, I know for sure, um, as we learned when in Sam's episode, when he was like getting mushrooms, the, and Seesaw mentioned it as well, um, that there, there are these like mushrooms that grow that are edible if they're processed pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, within like many of the cave networks or, uh, or in just kind of like the, the darker places. Um, so that's, that would be something that's harvest. Uh, and I think that's actually really important from a world building perspective to like, uh, kind of delineate like how much food is grown and how much is harvested. Um, because I think that in Ninoy, obviously, there's enough technology. They would have hydroponics and be growing quite a bit of food. They would have, like, ways of sustaining life. But then the actual food they're getting from the environment is... If the environment has all these earthquakes, right, it's going to be very hard for things to, to grow um, and that aren't, like, hardier. So that's kind of, like... That's how I was thinking about it, is, like, it's, t it's a bit telling about... The environment of Thela, mm -hmm. um, which then made me think like, okay, there's probably some vast amount of plants that do grow, but usually like we're at Courtney and I are in, in Albuquerque right now, and a lot of the, the plant life is harsher, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they're protected or whatever. And it, uh, it's been my experience that like the harsher the environment, the the pokier the plant is, the more poisonous it is, the just it's more suited defending itself. So I feel like. Ninoy would have a little bit of that and so a lot of like there'd be a lot of like uh predatory animals um birds I think are a pretty big would be a big source of food in fish mm -hmm. and like probably sea life mm -hmm. um like uh seaweed and things like that things so, so it's it'd be like a combo of like like what you see on like pacific northwest cuisine combined with like well, yeah. I mean, like, mushrooms, fish, seaweed. But maybe without, like, the abundance of, like, over overground right. pl plant life. Right. Um, that makes and, sense. Yeah, so that's that's probably, like, the best that I could come up with. Mm -hmm. um, but they're probably doing fine growing things, like, mm -hmm. up in the factories. So, um, Sam, you're not here. I hope when you listen to this, you're, like, not disappointed. That's the best I got for you. I will be better. <laughs> All right, so Atlas made some pretty crazy decisions in episode 30, Law of Choices. And I'm talking specifically in regards to claiming Gideus Kashin as temporary and short-term elected emergency ruler on the Council of Roses. How do you guys feel about that choice? And do you think there will be any unintended consequences, good or bad? I'm worried about that choice. Um, the Aesters kind of freak McKenna out a little bit in terms of their power, and and I think extreme power makes her nervous. Um, and so McKenna is nervous about that decision, um, and nervous that the Aesters won't ever give up power. Like once they have that territory, that they are forever going to control it, and they're going to change the laws and systems 
that that make it so that they could ever get out of power. So you're going to see like a dictatorship start to take place um, in a land where that is not intended. Um, so that's where my mind goes. I don't know what like the immediate day-to-day life will look like for people there, but that's my like long-term concern. Well, if that comes true, maybe Atlas will get a statue as the founder of New Nanoi. That would be awful. (laughs) (laughs) So I feel like this is a really perfect segue. So I'm just going to take liberties here. Uh, The party is held together by a thread. Well, and so far there seems that there's little endearing the party to one another. Now in Wrong Junk House, you guys had the battle with Zakar and... I want to know, do you guys feel like those moments where the party, quote unquote, bleeds together is like their only time that they're able to form some sort of kinship? Like, is that the only thing like outside of like, yeah, that's like building like a bond? Because like the only reason you guys are together, right, is to get to the Sunmaker. And you guys were just fighting about that, you know, friendly fighting. But it's between your characters, it's a pretty intense battle. So like, are is literally is battles just the only thing that's building a bond between everyone? I feel like McKenna has tried very hard to be friends with Atlas and has been denied over and over again. And so I feel like there's three threads to this party and they all link to each other. It's like maybe, yes, maybe there's six threads. So like two for each person going to each person, right? If you think of this triangle, right? I feel like McKenna's threads are reaching out to Atlas and to Clive. Clive is like starting to reach out to McKenna and Atlas has put up a wall and there is like, there is cement and then more cement and then there's a little bit more that says McKenna will not get in. Mm, Um, And there, like, McKenna has tried... She she's tried like talking, she's tried battling with him, like 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 not physically fighting like with him, not towards him, like on the same team. She's tried like staying out of his business, which she's obviously not very good at. She's tried everything and she just gets the cement wall. And so I feel like McKenna has her threads going out to these people. Um, and if if her threads are not being accepted, then that is their problem. And so I don't know what's going to happen, but it's not on McKenna. I feel like um, Clive has now this focus on the Shrine Cross and figuring that out. And the Shrine Cross connects to the Sunmaker and we connect to the Sunmaker. Um, and so I think he is committed to the party while we're seeking the Sunmaker. Um, and I think what whatever comes of that will lead towards the Shrine Cross. I think we're all going to be excited with whatever comes from the Sunmaker. Um, and I think some answers will come from Clive and from me and not for you. Um, and so, yeah, that's my thoughts about the Clive and the thread piece. You don't think Clive could potentially... I don't know. Strand you guys or something so that way he can reach the Sunmaker before you or something, you know? Like, I, I don't see him, like, if he was, if we're playing hypothetics here, I don't see him, like, trying to kill you guys to betray you, but I could see him, like, doing something like stranding you or I doing, don't... like, a deception in, like, fear that you guys would hurt the Sunmaker or McKenna's presence would scare the Sunmaker away. Like, I don't think there's like a very clear incentive to keep us out of it at this point. Maybe to keep Atlas out of it, but I've done nothing to show that I'm going to harm the Sunmaker and I've actually done the opposite. Okay. Um, Atlas, on the other hand, there's going to be some outside of party tension here that you're going to see. Nathan has made very clear his intent with the Sunmaker is not friendly. Um, and so I think that could cause Clive some hesitancy. That's my thoughts. I think McKenna's perfect in any way, so. Mm. Okay, moving on. 
Um, Isaac, what happened to Gorn? What happened to Gorn? Um, what do you think happened to Gorn? Did he betray you? Did he... Was he betrayed? I think he was hacked. But, like, what... What happened to him? I've never liked Gorn, for the record. But there was a point where I was starting to think, okay, maybe he's not the bad guy here. But then he totally turned on us. And so more of my question is, like, what caused him to turn? Was he hacked by the bird guy? Hmm. I don't, you know, that's something I can't say at this point. That would actually be spoil like spoilers, especially with where we left off, right? We left off with McKenna ahead of everyone running, remember like f- finally connecting the pieces that they that the that Varbos was not ex- the location that she had seen in the books. Um and I believe we left off with Clive and Atlas just behind and Gorn's body is still on on the ground and nobody checked to see if he was alive or dead. Um so Didn't someone grab Gorn? I can't, you know, I don't remember. But either way, it kind of like this the story cut off there like, you know, like your classic Saturday cartoon to be continued fade to black. And so I I feel like I can't say anything uh, cuz cuz spoilers. Um, as we're recording this right now, both Courtney and Nathan and Sam have not heard Wrong Junk or yeah, Wrong Junk House, and um, you guys are gonna absolutely love it. I hope. So I know I've said this before, but the episode was 72 minutes long when I started working on it. It is now 29 minutes long, and it took 21 hours, 1.3 hours per every minute. Can I just say, um, I'm going to give a shout out to Isaac here. I don't know that you get enough credit for all the audio work you do. And you've literally gone from knowing nothing about audio engineering. If you listen to like the first few episodes, you'll notice that. Um, to now, I would say you could probably get like a, like an entry mid-level job in audio engineering. Maybe. Like you've but... nailed it. And it's. I feel like we've all learned so much with Starlight. Um, and I think you're just like a really like concrete example of like the hard core skills that come with something like this. So you got some street cred now in the audio engineering world. Well, thanks. You guys let me know. <laughs> uh, I think the episode's pretty darn good. And I think you guys are going to love how it all comes out from every single moment um, of that episode. So, yeah. All right. Then I think with that, that's... I can't say it like that. I was going to say, that's a good place to call it, but we only save that for games. <laughs> um, no, this was super fun, uh, and I look forward to um, getting on to our next set of episodes and uh, seeing where the story goes, because the party is set to make some big discoveries, and, um, and yeah, I think it's going to drastically move the story forward. And then as a little bit of a heads up to everyone... Uh, we still have yet to talk about it, but the idea has been thrown around that we would take uh, maybe a mid-year break, like for like a month, similar to what we did in December. I don't know if that's what we'll do, but just keep a heads up for you guys. That could happen in July or August. It most likely will happen if I make the Olympic team. So, um, For those yeah. of you don't, who don't know, Isaac is also, I'm just going to keep bragging on oh, him for no. a minute, is a professional track and field runner. Um, and runs the 1500 meter and will be running the Olympic trials. Um, if anyone wants to uh, track that, I'm just going to pull up the date so everyone can be aware. Um, the, yep, so the 24th, um, will the first round will be um, at 6.05. The 25th will be at 4.05, which is the second round. And the finals will be on Sunday at 5. And that's all Pacific Standard Time. Yes. So, um, and it's just a fun way to combine the athletic world and the gaming world. And I think you do a good job balancing both of those. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. hey, Starlight's all about... 
for us, it's a it was a great way to re, it's a great way for us to reconnect. It's a great way for Courtney to meet my um, my brother, my childhood friend, um, as well as to have like share a fun story. And um, yeah, I hope on my end that there are a lot of athletes who realize it's okay to be an athlete and get into these kinds of things. Um, but share the love, and you guys are the best. And uh, with that, thank you. See you later, spacers. See you, spacers. Thank you for listening to this episode of Starlight. If you enjoyed this, please like, share, subscribe. For early releases, exclusive RPG content, and other bonus material, check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash starlightadventures. And to reach us for questions to be aired, email us at the starlightadventures at gmail.com. See you next Tuesday, spacers.